All right, as I, uh, as I pointed out to you on, uh, on Wednesday, um, we're going to be uh, doing problems. Oh, hang on. Bill, would you bring down the shades? It's, it doesn't tape well for you. Okay. Um, this one, we can put down the shade. This is good video. Make sure that if you're going to sit there, that's your responsibility. It's as much as you can handle. I'm anymore. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, we're going to be looking uh, at a condition of static equilibrium. Well, we've, you want to talk about a little bit of physics one. Uh, you know as well as I do already that that's going to mean that the forces will sum to zero. So what we got to work on for the first couple days is just this left-hand part, just the summing of the forces. Uh, it, it may be uh, for some of you seeing a little bit elementary to be going over this, but we it's so important to what we do from here on. And we will be doing stuff in this class in three dimensions. And uh, we didn't do that very much in physics one. We do, we'll do more stuff in three dimensions here because it's, it's uh, important enough for what we're trying to do here, that uh, we really need to know how to sum the forces. So for now, we're not necessarily going to worry about whether they sum to zero or not. We just want to know how do we sum forces. How do we put a couple forces together? So remember, that is all about vectors. Forces are not the only vectors we're going to have in here. We're going to have a couple other vectors as well. And they're going to be just as important as the force vectors. It's just we're starting with these uh, as we get going. And uh, so we need to know how to handle all of these vectors. And it's going to be quite a bit more involved than it was in physics one because you're quite a bit brighter than you were in physics one, hopefully. If, you, if your physics one teacher was worth anything, you should be brighter than you were then. So remember, as we go through this, all vectors have three things. If I ask you for a vector quantity, and I may not say it as that, I may just say find the force in this problem, you need to know force is a vector. All vectors have three things. If I don't give them those three things, then I don't get the problem right. And I don't deserve to. And I can smile sweetly at them all I want. It's not going to work. Oh, Trevor, you got such a sweet smile, though. So you can do anything you want the rest of the term. All three, three things. One of them, yes. units. We'll put that last <laughs> because that depends upon one of the others. Magnitude. Magnitude is, is just how big is the thing, usually represented by a simple number. But if we're drawing the vectors, we can represent it by the length of that vector, the length of the arrow. Meaning that a big force is a big arrow and a little force is a little arrow, and we can visually compare those things. We can even make scale drawings and solve the problems that way. Though it's not uh, all, not as accurate. For some people it's easier than it is for others. Some of you can, will even do, a, will even go to a drafting program and draft your solutions, make the arrows a particular length at a particular angle, and then join all the arrows, and you've got your solution right there, right out of the program. Um, once we've established the magnitude, it's got to have units or it's not going to make any sense. And the last part? Direction. Direction. A vector, a force to the right is terrifically different than a force to the left, or a force up or down, or whatever possibilities, and we can cover anything that they might be. So all vectors have to have that. So we can represent a vector, maybe a force vector, maybe not, because we're going to have several, as a arrow of a particular length representing the magnitude at a particular direction, usually represented by an angle from some line, but not necessarily. You can draw a picture and in that picture will be the direction I need, and it's right there. But that can be a little bit, a uh, little bit too unspecific for our needs. 
you probably don't want somebody designing a building that you need to go into and survive your time in. And all he's doing is designing and saying, well, it kind of looks like that. That's pretty close. I think it'll stand up. I don't really care. I'm out of town. So we're going to, uh, in some way, have to get the direction. Uh, as we go through this a little bit more and remind ourselves how we do this, uh, you're going to see there's several ways you can get me those three things. And I don't always specify what one of the ways you use. You use whichever one way you're more comfortable with. If you're very, very comfortable and good at drawing problems to scale, so you could draw several force vectors, add them together on the paper, and come up with a real good answer, you can do it that way. Uh, most of us do a little bit better if we do it analytically than graphically. But uh, as we add things together, remember um, maybe this is F1 and we want to add one force to another force. Graphically, it might be something like that. Very, very similar. When you first learned about vectors, you probably learned about them as taking a trip. If I go two blocks east and three blocks north, and you draw vectors that represent that, and you say, here's what my trip will look like overall. That's, a, that's exactly what any vector addition is going to look like. And then we know that the resultant vector is something like that, where the resultant vector is the sum of all the force vectors in the problem. So graphically, we can do that. You get out a protractor and a ruler, and you draw these things such that they're to scale. If F1 is the same size force as F2 is, those two arrows should be the same length. That's exactly what the magnitude represents in a uh, drawing like that. And if you do it carefully, make sure the angles are care. You, you could have a decent solution. You could say to me, there's R. And I could look at that and see if you're right. You could help me a little bit by using your scale and tell me just what the magnitude units and direction are, but you wouldn't necessarily have to. Um, sometimes we're going to have to subtract vectors. Maybe for some reason we have F1 minus F2. Yeah, it's the sum, and sums don't mean negative, but if F1's pointing in a different direction, maybe we have to do that. In that case, uh, what I typically need to do, let me change that a little bit for what's next. What, what I need to do, I can't always remember how to subtract two vectors and make 100% sure I always got it right. So what I like to do is turn this into an addition, which is so easy. By just adding negative vector. What happens when a vector is uh, a negative and another vector? Simply the opposite direction. Everything else is the same. Magnitude is the same, the direction is the same, except that the arrowhead's on the other side. So I take this very same vector, and you see how scientifically I do this. I'm going to move over and that's now minus F2. And since I'm adding vectors, I go from where I started to where I finished. And now I always get the right direction. The, the, trouble I have is you were probably taught to subtract vectors by putting them tail to tail. No, wait, where's F2? F2 is down like that. Down like that. Wait, is that how you were taught to subtract vectors, put them tail to tail? Which is no big deal, but then I always get confused. What happens next? Do I go from here to here or here to here. I never get it right. Now, uh, I never make a mistake. I know what to do. I don't get it wrong. 
Now I can compare the two and know that I do that. But my small brain just needs me to flip the vector around, then add them, then I don't get it wrong. So you do whatever you need to do. We will do very little actual graphical solution of our problems, just because the inaccuracies involved. If we do that, I gotta make sure you know how to draw, make a drawing to scale. You know how to use a protractor, that you're gonna be careful with that. You're gonna reconvert in and out of the scale accurately and appropriately every single time. Uh, plus, uh, graphical solution kind of stops there. We can't do that much with it. Whereas if we do an analytical solution, we can use the computer to help us with the design. We can change things easily and it just changes the values as calculated analytically. Things become a lot easier. So we'll spend most of our time in fact, I don't know that we'll do much else other than solving these problems, summing the forces, and then making sure they equal zero by doing it analytically. So, analytical solutions. And by solutions, I mean either we're just summing the forces and that's all we're doing now, or later we sum the forces, set that sum equal to zero, and find out the parts that we don't know. Uh, either way, we can do it analytically. And by that, I mean that we use the trigonometry I need you to have had taken before you get here. In fact, you needed it before you got to Physics 1 for the very same reason, because we use the trig of the solution, the situation, which if you remember trigonometry, its full name is actually right angle trigonometry or right triangle trigonometry because everything depends upon the breaking of vectors into orthogonal components. It doesn't have to be orthogonal. We can break a vector into components that are not orthogonal. By orthogonal I mean, what do I mean by orthogonal? It's a, a cool word. It's got O's and G's. And, uh, can you imagine what you score on uh, Scrabble with orthogonal on triple word score? Oh man. Orthogonal means there's a 90 degree angle involved. We're talking about things that are perpendicular. So we're going to break these vectors into their perpendicular components using right angle trigonometry. We don't have to break them into orthogonal components. The components don't have to be uh, perpendicular to each other, but that's what we'll do in this class. So we'll break that into its components using trigonometry. So this might be F1 in the X direction as the horizontal component, in this case horizontal, and the other component is F1 in the y direction. Be careful how you label these things because it just can make it less confusing for you, which means you make fewer mistakes when you're less confused. It be less confusing for me, which means you would lose fewer points because I'm not confused and then getting angry. So uh, take a little time to think about your problem. Sometimes you get part way to a problem and think, you know, the just the labeling I've chosen doesn't work right here. And so you get on a new piece of paper and you start it again and get a better start to it with fewer chances of errors in there. But all we're saying with this is that the vector F1 is made up of two vector components that are orthogonal to each other in some ordinal direction, which means uh, lined up in some coordinate direction I've chosen. And without specifying it, it looks like I've already said the coordinate directions I'll use are x and y, because I got x and y there. Horizontal is almost always x, vertical is almost always y. But don't chain yourself to that. It's going to make some problems a lot harder. But to start with, we're, we're easy to go there. And it's actually made up of two vectors that are 
orthogonal, perpendicular to each other, and those two vectors give us the same thing as the original vector did, and vice versa. Ah, you remember that from, from uh, trig and, and physics one. Uh, so that's actually one way you could give me F1 if that was what I asked for in the problem. From that, from the two components in known direction, known orthogonal directions, I can get these three things. If you told me what the F1x and F1y vectors were, I would be able to put those back together to get the vector F1. So that's one way you could represent the uh, magnitude, direction, and units of the vector F1. You could draw it. We got it there. That's one way. You can list it just in a straight components. That's one way. Uh, what we'll use is, is the very same thing, just a slightly different definition uh, of exactly that component form. But it's going to be a lot more useful to us in a couple of weeks when we get in, especially when we get into three-dimensional stuff, that we do it as a vector, uh, as a magnitude, and then the units will go with it, in a particular direction as described by the unit vector. I think you're all pretty familiar with the unit vectors. And so these two things mean exactly the same thing. And when we have a third dimension, we'll just do that in the z direction with the k unit vector. So I know the magnitude and the units that would go with that and the direction of the vector component in the x direction in the same way. This is going to be very useful to us because we are going to be using unit vectors in completely unknown directions coming up here. It's nice when it's horizontal and vertical, but that's just too simple. That's for, that's for freshmen. You're not freshmen, you're sophomores. So we're going to do harder. We're going to have unit vectors in almost any direction, which means we're going to have to find out what, that direct, what the direction of the unit vector itself is. We've got to figure out where it's pointing. We'll get to that in a little bit. Right now, I typically points, of course, in the x direction and is horizontal, but not always. And j is typically in the vertical direction, but not always. And remember, those, those are the only vectors that don't have any units. It's kind of odd that unit vectors don't have units. These are vectors of magnitude 1 in a particular direction, and they have no units on them. That's why we give them a special little hat, why we call them, well we call them unit vectors because their length is one, not because they have units. That's just an unfortunate use of the same word in two different ways. So we'll, we'll figure out how to come up with new unit vectors when i and j and k just aren't good enough for us. We need something else. We'll come up with that. And then another way we could do this, uh, and again, remember, all we're striving for is that we have these three things for every vector. And so these are ways to do it. Draw it, do it in that form, do it in that form. These really aren't all that different. Uh, they're pretty, pretty similar, which is good. They mean the same thing. Or we could do uh, something like this. F1 is uh, in the x direction, is next to that known angle, so we use the cosine, so we could do it like that, and of course the other part is the sine, and there too I would know everything I need to know. F1 is common to both, so I could pull that out, so there's the magnitude and the units, and then the direction would be entirely available in the other part. And I'd still have those three things that I need. Magnitude, direction, and units. 
And then when we start doing problems, of course, there'll be values in there. So these are, these are ways. Uh, the last way that we could represent the magnitude uh, and units is you could, uh, well, tell me what the magnitude and units are, you know, uh, uh, 12 newtons, you could write that down. And then you could say at some angle theta degrees. And there too, I of course then would have the magnitude, the direction, and the units for any answer. So uh, some problems will be easy to do that way, and we can do them that way. I mean, for, for sketching stuff at the board, uh, that kind of works out. Some, some will be very easy in some different form. Um, so we need to, probably need to use them all. But you might have one you're more comfortable with. One of those might look to you, and you might look at that and say, that's a yummy one. I like that one there. And that's the one you'll use. Be careful. If you give me one that's correct and take it one step farther, because we can get from this one very easily down to this one, well, especially here, because this is F1 with a tangent theta equal to, well, remember the tangent is the side opposite over the side adjacent. So this would be the tangent And that way I could find theta. So you can go from this one down to this one, back to this one. But if you're correct with this one and then you screw something up and get down to this one and it's wrong, you just lost points. So don't feel like you're going to get extra points for going a little bit farther down this line when all the information's already there. You've already done the problem and you're just trying to do it a little bit more. Be careful. If you screw up one of those steps, it's no different than you doing a design good as an engineer and screwing up the last step and the building falls down. It still fell down. You can't go back to all the bodies in the heat there and say, but if you look back on page three, I did it right. You should have gotten in the building then. All right, so a so, bunch of different ways that you can give me these things on a vector. Um, this is very, very useful to us. Let's clean things up a little bit, uh, just so I have some room. I'll leave those things there. Just come down here, because these, these are just sort of further steps of the very same thing. So as we go to some horses, or the other vectors we're going to have to sum. We're going to have to have some lots of them here. What's nice about the analytical method, I think, is that we don't have to add the vectors themselves. We can add the components of the vectors. So if I want to find the sum of all the vectors, I can sum up all the x parts, and I can sum up all the y parts, and those together are going to represent the sum of the vectors. So if I have a vector F1 and it's a force acting on something and I've got a force F2 also acting on that thing, whatever it may be, and I want to sum those together, I can pick an x, y direction. Uh, if you're going to have an x and a y direction, you need to let me know what those are. It's not always horizontal and vertical. Sometimes, as you remember from Physics 1, it helps us a little bit if we tilt them some. It makes the solutions easier, mathematically easier. It doesn't change the physics, it just changes the mathematics. So we'll talk about that in a bit. So you can just let me know what your x and y directions are. And, and if you want to pick something else, pick something else. Just let me know what it is. Then we can break the vectors into those component directions. So there's f1x. 
F1Y, just like we had here before earlier on the same board. And we can break F2 into its component directions. F2X there. Be careful where we label these or it gets confusing. Uh, oops. That one's not going to get us there. Okay, we can we can break F2 into its component directions, and we can do that with the trig functions because we know presumably the two angles involved and the resultant of those two we can get by simply summing the two component directions add the 2x components to each other and then make sure that we know that's in the x direction so it gets the, the x unit vector, the i hat vector. And we can figure out what the y component of the resultant vector is by doing the same thing in the y direction or the j direction, which are the same thing in this case. And we could do that for as many vectors as we have. We have 100 vectors. We just add them all up this way. It's pretty easy to keep stuff straight that way. I have to be a little careful. If, uh, if something goes down, then we'll probably call that a negative. Generally, we'll take things up or right as positive. Down or left as negative. But you don't have to. Uh, that's pretty much what I implied with this little picture anyway, so don't do two different things. Don't draw that and then say x positive to the left, because you drew that it was positive to the right. That's what this implies. So stick to your, choose whatever you want, stick to that. Don't uh, flip flop around as we start going through these things. So as we add all those things together, we can get then the uh, full resultant vector by adding the components, doing the trig to get the pieces out of there, and getting all those parts put together. We don't, uh, we don't have to, to stick with that uh, orthogonal business alone, because maybe we're adding two vectors say that they were labeled like this. Pretty much the same as what we had before. F1 and F2, and we're adding those together. Maybe you learn to do this using the parallelogram system. Who knows what you were taught by those math people, but it might be something like that. Whether you do the vectors head to toe to head to toe to head to toe and go all the way around, or you add them tail to tail and then across the parallelogram, you get the same thing. Um, however, uh, we don't always have to divide them into uh, into orthogonal uh, pieces here. Maybe we'll call this. Uh, no, I don't know. What do I want to call it? Anyway, uh, the point being that uh, we can still solve all the unknown parts, the magnitude of R and the direction at which R goes by using the law of sines and cosines. Which is something like the magnitude is r squared. So we screwed that, you get the magnitude of r. Anybody else remember what the rest of it is? Oh, there Trevor's rolling his eyes. It's, it's kind of like, uh, it starts a lot like 
the uh, starts a lot like the Pythagorean theorem does, but then has this additional part to it. And you remember which which angle? It's actually the angle that's opposite that R. So maybe I'll even call this theta R. So it's cosine of theta R. And if you notice, uh, on a right triangle, theta R is 90. Cosine of 90 is, Bill, Bill's going into his mental trig calculator. Let's say cosine of 90 is zero. So this disappears. So if theta r is 90, we have a right triangle. We have Pythagorean there. So it's not like this is something new. Trouble is, you might not necessarily know what theta r is. So you can use the law of sines to get that. Where uh, basically that's something like, let's see, f1 over the sine of the angle that um, it faces, which if I give it another label, maybe I'll call this, because uh, that's, that's the angle that faces F1 or vice versa, so I'll call this uh, theta, I don't know, I guess theta 3. I already have a 1 and a 2, so there's a 3. So. I want to, when you take this again next year, maybe I'll straighten it out so that these two numbers will be the same. I'll change my picture a little bit, and then uh, things will go a little smoother. But it, it's on the picture there, so it's not like we're guessing at something. That ratio equals the same ratio for the other side. F2 is facing, let's see, what's its angle? Uh, Oh, I guess I have to label that 4. Is that right? Is that how that's coming out? What did I label before? I didn't have this much. Yeah, you do need to take this again next year. Actually, F2, yeah, I don't want that angle. Because I already got what I need. Um, F2, which is this side, is facing the angle 1. Theta 1. We already got what we need. We didn't need theta 4. And then R faces its own angle, theta R, sine of theta R. So then could F1 be over sine of theta 2? F1 over sine of, no, theta 2 is a completely different angle. No. Uh, yeah, but if it's across. Oh, yeah, if, if, but then that would also change you have a different theta three here. So you, you, you have to do this on one of the triangles. Either that one, where F1 is opposite three, F2, which is this length, is opposite one, okay. and R is up. Or you can do it on this triangle. But you can't cheat both. You can't do a little bit of both. Yeah, that's why I had to take off that theta 4 I started to put on there. Okay, so uh, we don't have to do that much. Just don't forget that that's there in your toolkit. It's there in your satellite. Sure. But doesn't theta 3 equal theta 2? Yeah. So yeah, you can... You, yeah. They're, these are not completely independent triangles. They're, they're the same triangle just flipped over with different labels. So, you so use if you, two. yeah, you, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can use theta two, but in the right place. Where? Instead of theta three. Instead of, yeah, because theta two is facing the length F1, so F1 could be theta two instead. But uh, mixing and matching them, and we're not going to do that much anyway. Most of our things fall nice and right triangles, <laughs> luckily. So we 
basically the best thing to do is use one, just hold in one of the triangles and use one triangle. Yes. Transfer beta two yeah. angle to beta yeah. three. Because it's always the length of one side over the sine of the angle opposite that length. And theta 2 is not opposite that f1, it's opposite this f1. So it works, it's the same, but uh, if we have to use log cosine, it's, we don't usually have both triangles there. We only have one of them, and, and so that's why we're using this log sine and cosine. So, practice problem for you then. So, imagine we have some kind of islet there upon which we uh, attach a couple ropes and pull on them. So we've got that rope with a 40 kilonewton force and then we have another rope attached to it. with a 46 kilonewton force and we happen to know the angle on that is 32 degrees. So find the net force caused by those two ropes on the island. Just sort of a warm up. First couple days here is a reminder for the most part. And I'm asking for a vector, so I'm going to need magnitude, units, and direction of the resultant vector in. Uh, in whichever way you choose to do it. Uh, I can already see I need to start retraining some of you. Don't make your drawings too small. This is a pretty simple drawing. doesn't need to be real big. But we're going to have much more complicated drawings coming up. And if you make them too small, they're not going to be of much use to you. So be generous with your paper. You don't get extra credit because you can take your notes on four pages and somebody else has to do it on five pages. That's not the way this works. You get extra red credit because you're bringing the cookies. It's the only way to do it. It works every time. You can't cook them yourself because this spit in them. You know, I on Facebook and say, I gave my professional cookies and I spit in them. See, you didn't even say, no, I wouldn't. You just said, yeah, guilty. <laughs> All right, two ropes tugging on an eyelet. free body diagram. Label them if you want. sort of a quick sketch to how to add those together, that'll help you make sure that your analytical solution is correct. It should pretty much match the picture you get. Because we know about 
about what that resultant vector should look like. But we need to be more specific. If we can't just say about and have that be good enough. This is the big leaks. About's not good enough. Other than uh, worrying about significant figures. Don't be silly.
want to see in the x direction, f2 is minus the sine of 32. Because the x direction is opposite the angle we know. And opposite the angle is the sine. Minus, because we know it's running backwards. So this is minus sine 32 i. Is that right? Minus, because it's opposite the direction I picked as our positive direction. Sine of 32, because it's opposite the angle I know. Sine doesn't always have to be the vertical component or the horizontal component. It has to do with what angle you know. And then the other part is cosine. 32. Yeah. Is that right? Nobody's nodding. Is that wrong? Is it, is it ugly? Is it unattractive? different than what you did. A little bit. A little bit. We'll see though if we get the same thing. Did it make sense? It did one side to fix my I and J's. Yeah. My negative sign. Yeah. Be careful. Negative signs like all the other courses you've ever had with me and will. Negative signs are as important as anything in here we're doing. Is that 24.4? No, no, I mean, where that 24? I don't know where that came from. I don't have it written down. What's the sign of 32? Point five. Who, who, who? Point five five. Point five five. So this is minus point five five I. Plus the cosine of 32. 0.83. 0.83 J. Or you can work that out a little bit farther. Um, this should be 24.4. Is that 46 times 0.55? So that's the that's the length of the x component of f2 minus about 24. Yeah, that look about right. Just kind of eyeballing it a little bit. I. Uh, what's 0.83 times 46? 39. Does that give you magnitude, units, and directions of F2? Yeah, it sure does. And it's nice to leave it in that form, because now we can add the two vectors together. We have the I components, we have the J components, and we're all done. So R, which is F1 plus F2, is the I components added together, which is 40 minus 24, 4 in the I direction. Don't lose the minus sign and don't add I components to J components. We practice strict segregation in this class. We don't let unlike things mix. This is not society, this is business. And then 0 plus 39 J um, keep my brackets straight because I'm going to have the units in there. Um, 
and then we can do the 40 minus 24 and all. Uh, what's the magnitude of R? And what's the direction of R? The information's there, but I want you to tell me specifically. I want the length of R and the size of the angle R, if you don't have it already. I don't always ask for both. I've got the components there. That's units, magnitude, direction. Not directly is it there, but it's kind of it's mostly there. Uh, 
round, do most of your rounding off at the last step. Don't round off as you go because then they can accumulate. But everything's there. Magnitude, units, and directions. And I know what the direction means because it's labeled there. You say theta r equals that. All right. Uh, we got a, a minute left. Here's a question for you on this problem. We're working towards static equilibrium. We're working towards the sum of the forces equals zero. Because if they don't, then the thing's going to accelerate. Is this, the, we have this, these ropes test, is, is this islet in equilibrium, uh, static equilibrium? I don't know, no, no. Come back later. I didn't ask for a sentence. I said, is it yes or no? Take a stand, man. Depends on the connection. Yes. I don't want depends on. I want you to yes or no. Okay, forget it. <laughs> Dana. No. No? Bill. Oh, you're 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 busy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is this islet in static equilibrium? Yes or no? And Trevor's already dibs the one depends answer. Uh, no. No. So I get everybody said no except for Trevor. Well, um, Iceland has to be upside of everyone else. If you said no, then what you're saying is the sum of the forces doesn't equal zero. Because this is all we have for static equilibrium. The forces have to sum to zero. Uh, do the forces sum to zero? No. Uh, Not what did I tell you about the sum of the forces when I was talking about free body diagrams on Wednesday? How many, what forces do you sum? All, no, I said all, what kind of forces? Pertinent. All the pertinent forces. Is this a sum of all the pertinent forces? Yeah. No. So we don't know if it's got static equilibrium because we don't have all the pertinent forces. We just have to have two of them. So even though that's the same symbol, sum of the forces, that's kind of generic. This means sum of all the pertinent forces must equal zero for a static equilibrium. That's not what we're necessarily looking for here. We're just looking for the result of the two forces that happen to have. So don't put more into it than there is yet. We will uh, work on static. You know, I hope, what other force is required to put this in static equilibrium. You need the opposite of this force. If those two are pulling that way, there's got to be something pulling back to cancel it. So we know that the attachment, however we mount it to the wall, has got to be equal and opposite to that force. If there are no other forces involved. Okay, have a good weekend.